It's David Sinclair here. I'm talking to you from uh, my home in Boston during this pandemic, uh, stayed home time. But I also wanted to talk to you about a new paper that we have coming out or just came out in uh, the journal Aging. And its title is why does COVID-19 disproportionately affect the elderly, which has become one of the biggest questions, I think, in this whole pandemic. And if we could understand why the elderly were more susceptible, first of all, we could help them survive and have less severe cases, but also we could learn perhaps why younger people are also more susceptible. One thing that I often hear when I pose that question is, oh, it's just that old people are sicker and they die. Well, that's not a good enough explanation because the elderly, even if they are healthy, have a much greater chance of dying than someone who say less than 65. Uh, in fact, of all the main causes of death or risk factors in COVID-19, age is by far the most important one, independent of all those other risk factors. In fact, there was a study that just came out a couple of weeks ago on uh, looking at the UK health system, and they had 17 million patients. And they, they said that of the order of ranking of what's important, it started at uh, point five, number five was, in fact, a study just came out in the UK that looked at 17 million patients, and they looked at the hazard ratios. In other words, what are the various things that are part of... So a study just came out in the UK that looked at 17 million people that had COVID-19, and they could tell us, based on that, what the ranking of the what's, a, what's called the hazard ratio of which symptoms and which lifestyle uh, and comorbidities track with COVID-19 fatality risk. And actually, in order, starting with number five, it was diabetes, obesity. Number three was being male. That's fairly risky. Uh, having cancer of the blood was bad which makes sense because you've disrupted your immune system. But by far, the riskiest thing is age, independent of all these other things. In fact, compared to these other risks, age is basically the major determinant. If you're 80, the numbers were you're about tenfold higher to someone who's in their uh, late 50s. So that led us to try to figure out what is going on with the aged that makes them more susceptible. And again, it's not just that those people start out sicker. And so we've written this perspective and gathered a lot of data from around the world, papers that have come out, papers that have been uh, in, in the publication. So in this, in this perspective, we've gathered a lot of data from around the world, new papers, old papers, and really put together a list of things that we think are the most likely explanations for why the elderly are su succumbing to COVID-19, independent of their actual underlying diseases and frailty. So let's first go through uh, one of the figures. You'll see figure one is a beautiful illustration drawn by my wonderful co-authors, Maeve Mueller and Maeve McNamara. And it's a picture of what goes wrong in the elderly compared to someone who can clear the infection. And what you'll see is that there's a cut through the lung. And what happens in the elderly is that the virus goes down into the lung, causes a hyperimmune response. And in the late stages of the disease, in the elderly particularly, it's a hyperimmune response, uh, which we call the cytokine storm. And what we've recently discovered, the planet that is, not just my lab, uh, is that the virus can attack the endothelial cells of the aged. And that's not just in the lung, which of course is a problem for getting uh, blood flow and oxygen across. But what's also important is that these endothelial cells that line the blood vessels, particularly the microcapillaries, line at the heart, the brain, uh, even the extremities. And so what we're seeing in elderly patients, particularly that undergo this cytokine storm, is, is what's called a coagulopathy, uh, which means that lining of the blood vessels is causing, getting inflamed and causing clots to form. And you get a rise in this uh, marker called the D-dimer, which is a breakdown product of clotting. And what's, what we're seeing is even in young people, there's propensity for stroke, myocardial infarction, a heart attack, uh, and even things like numbing of the toes and the fingers. And you can see that there are what are called chill blains in some people, you get these dark areas on the body. So that's particularly fatal uh, if it's not controlled, and it's very difficult to control that. So what's behind all of this susceptibility to the aged? Well, there are two things going on mainly. One is the inability to clear the virus initially. So if you're young, you can have a spike in viral numbers. It starts to get in your throat, drift down into the lungs. But young people tend to not have this overreaction. They tend to form antibodies fairly rapidly and clear the viral. And if you clear the virus very quickly, you'll actually have very little risk of going into hospital or the ICU. Um, as an aside, uh, if you don't have a very strong case of COVID-19, looks like you don't mount a very strong immune response. But that's another topic for future discussion. What's more important is to focus on what is it about the age, age, aged immune system that's defective, that leads to their inability to clear the virus. And then the second part that's important for the aged 
is what happens once they start to clear the virus and why is that so detrimental? And what we are seeing is that the virus particles, particularly the viral RNA, lasts a long time, sometimes for weeks in the body. And those remnants actually are what we think are stimulating this hyperimmune reaction, the cytokine storm, which is driven largely by a particular protein complex called the inflammasome, which is hyper already hyperactive uh, chronically in the aged. Uh, and we'll talk about that later on. But just to, to give a shout out to the, the my co-authors, their drawings were, were beautiful. Um, so we'll get to uh, back to the disease course in a moment. One of the things I want to bring up is one of the, the great things in this article that Amber and Maeve did was that they drew a table of the of respiratory viral infections and what are the risk factors. And so I have the table in front of me. So I'll just read off some of them, which you can see in the paper. MERS, uh, in the original SARS, they actually had uh, high risk. One of the risks was uh, 1 and type 2 di diabetes, obesity, cardiac cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, old age. This is for MERS. For SARS-1, it was, again, diabetes, renal disease, neurological diseases, metabolic, um, and interestingly, dermatological diseases, which is probably an immune thing. But why, why is that important? Well, what that tells us is that these particular type of coronaviruses attack the aged, and in particular, the aged with underlying comorbidities, these underlying diseases. But what I would like to, to us to consider and what I'd like to argue is that it's not just about having obesity, having diabetes, having heart disease that is the problem. Those are symptoms of a more insidious problem, which is that those people are most likely older than their chronological age, um, or they're actually very old biologically because they've lived a long time. But we know that biological age will be accelerated by being obese, by not exercising, and just living the lifestyle that, that we know from epidemiology is not the perfect one. At least half of America is overweight or obese. If you include certain cutoffs, some people estimate that it's over 75%. And this drives the aging process. Um, and one of the side effects, of course, is obesity. But obesity may not be the main driver, actually. That's a, a symptom of the problem that, that I want to talk to you about. So there are lots of things that go wrong in the aged body. And by aged, I'm not just talking about birthday candles. I'm talking about actual biological age. Now, biological age can be measured in a variety of ways. Uh, let's just talk about that for a minute. We can measure the DNA methylation status of our cells, the so-called Horvath DNA methylation clock. Uh, we can measure that pretty easily in a blood test or a swab from the cheek these days, get a very accurate uh, estimation of how old someone is biologically. Uh, but there are other things that change in a predictable way. Um, and unlike 10 years ago, where we thought we'd never have biomarkers, now we have quite a few. You can look at changes in immune cell diversity, uh, such as T cells. You can build a very good immune clock. Uh, you can look at the levels of NAD in the body, which decline with time. Uh, one of the things that we, Gordon Lauk and I, Professor Gordon Lauk and I wrote about is a paper actually also in the journal Aging, is that, uh, that the immune system changes in part because sugars change that are attached to proteins. This is the process of glycation. And Gordon's lab has done an amazing job. They've found that there's a glycan clock, and what he calls it is the glycan age of a person. And why is that important? Because as we get older, the type of sugars that are attached to proteins in the body, whether it's antibodies or actually the coronavirus spike protein and even the ACE2 uh, so-called receptor on the surface of endothelial cells, these are all changed as we get older in terms of their glycation. Um, and if you look at figure three in the paper, you can see a beautiful rendition of, of these changes. And we also have epigenetic changes that control how cells behave. And we know that during aging, epigenetic changes occur. And we think that cells lose their identity. And that's true for immune cells. It's true for the lining of the blood vessels, the endothelial cells. And that, that may be why the virus has a greater chance of attacking an older person's body as well. And then finally, there's the process of immunosenescence. Now, there's two types of immunosenescence, and I don't want to get confused, people confused here. Immunosenescence typically refers to just the aging of the overall immune system. That means that there's less variety of T cells, there's less ability to mount an immune, re immune response and clear viruses. But there's also cellular immunosenescence, what you call immuno, uh, but there's also cellular senescence, which is a different story, which is about cells checking out of the cell cycle and becoming more like zombie cells. And you can stay in those for beta-galactosidase or P16, and this is another type of cellular senescence. There's some overlap between immunosenescence and cellular senescence. 
but it's important to realize they're not the same thing. And so that's the lead up to the whole paper, which goes into detail about these various causes, susceptibility to viruses in general, but also to COVID-19. Now, one of the areas that we work on, of course, are the sirtuins. These are enzymes that our bodies make. There are seven of them in most of our cells. And they're very important for fighting against diseases, both chronic diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's, we believe, based on a lot of mouse and human uh, genetic studies. Uh, but they also, we're finding, are important for viral defenses. And we put forward a, an hypothesis in this uh, paper that the sirtuin uh, defenses are, are lost during COVID-19 infections. And one of the reasons for that is the following. So sirtuins need NAD. And unfortunately, as we get older, we think that a lot of our cells lose the ability to make NAD effectively, and they also destroy it for reasons that we don't fully understand yet. But what we've also discovered in my lab and in others, uh, Charlie Brenner uh, put out a, a nice paper about this a few weeks ago, is that the virus, coronavirus and other types of viruses, deplete NAD in cells. And we think this is part of their, their defense, the viral attack and the inability of cells to survive the attack. Now, they do this through activation of the PARPs. PARPs are poly-ADP ribosyl trans. Uh, polymerases. So they do this by activating the PARPs, such as PARP1, PARP12, PARP14. And PARPs are enzymes that polymerize NAD and deplete it from the cell. And we think that by either blocking the PARP activity or replacing, replenishing the NAD levels in infected cells and in the body of patients, we can give them a better chance of survival. Now, why would we worry about NAD in sirtuins? Well, sirtuins, particularly sirtuin 6, sirtuin 1, and sirtuin 2, they control inflammation and they dampen it when it's overactive. I mentioned the inflammasome. Well, one of the key components of the inflammasome is called NLRP3. And the acetylation, chemical addition to that protein is what causes it uh, to be active. Um, and actually, if we deacetylate of enzymes like SIRT1 and SIRT2 deacetylate in LRP3, it brings that activity uh, down. And so what we're thinking is that when cells are infected, the NAD levels go down. Sirtuins are unable to dampen the inflammatory response and you get this cytokine storm. So in other words, if we were to raise NAD levels in patients, we may be able to prevent their bodies from going into this state of shock and a septic-like response. Now, I will admit, at first, I didn't think this was something that I should rush into. Of course, I, I would look like somebody with a hammer looking for a nail because you'd think that everything that I do looks like an NAD problem. But studies like the Brenner paper that came out, as well as studies over the last five years in my lab that have looked at NAD changes during macrophage activation and the PARP response have really pushed me into the belief that, as I write in this article with my co-authors, that NAD is part of this story. Now, it's not the whole story. In fact, the NAD story in this paper is only a, a small part of it, about 5%. But I want to talk about it because a lot of people are asking me, David, what about NAD? And interestingly, I've been working with a team uh, in Boston on making an NAD precursor a drug. And so for the last two years, with the help of a great team at Brigham and Women's Hospital, they've been testing the safety and efficacy of uh, an NAD precursor called MIB626, uh, which is a proprietary version of an NAD booster, is that so far the molecule is extremely safe in the people that have been tested. It's able to greatly raise NAD levels. Now, uh, there's just some debate out there in the Twitterverse that the molecules that we work on in my lab and at, at uh, in these clinical trials don't raise NAD and are not effective. Well, I can tell you that you probably shouldn't get your scientific uh, information from Twitter because it's completely wrong. And now what's interesting and exciting is that in the next few weeks, very extensive double-blind placebo-controlled study is about to begin with this molecule. And we'll see pretty quickly, I think, whether patients are helped by raising an AD particularly the, the more severe ones. Now, there are anecdotal case studies. Already, some of them are online that you can look up if you're interested of patients recovering quite rapidly, supposedly, with treatment with NAD boosters like NMN, which is one of the, the ones that we work on. But those individual case studies don't prove anything, as we now know from you know having studied other molecules and other people studied molecules in the world for COVID-19. So that's why we've decided to do this very rigorous placebo-controlled study and not just go for compassionate use. Uh, and we'll see over the next few weeks, perhaps a few months, realistically, whether this molecule that we're working on is going to dampen the inflammatory response in patients that uh, really need it. You know, drugs are very hard to make. Most of them don't work. So I'm, I'm not promising anything. I'm not expecting too much. Uh, but I think that we need to give this a shot. And the other reason for believing in this work is that aging, as I started out in this review, uh, in this talk, 
uh, mentioning, we think aging is the major driver of COVID-19 susceptibility, aging of all of the different parts of the body, in particular the immune and circulatory systems. Now, if we can delay aging or reverse it, perhaps in some way with NAD boosting or with other drugs that are out there, such as metformin, which Neil Barzilai is arguing could be used to bring down blood sugar to improve the body's survival, these kind of uh, longevity molecules could be used to bring not just the virus down, but boost the survival and the resilience and the defenses of the host up in the same way that uh, you don't just have weapons of war, you have defenses as well. And so on the defensive side, I think bringing up the defenses of the aged is just as valid, if not more important than attacking the virus itself. So why would I say it's, it's just as important or more important? Well, consider that this is not the only virus that's going to attack humanity going forward. And vaccines, while they're great and we hold out for one, it probably won't work against the next outbreak whether it's bird flu, regular flu, or another coronavirus, or even a mutated version of this one that's out in the population. So we need to work also on the body's ability to fight infections in general. So with that, I think I should uh, let you all go. I've talked long enough about this paper. I hope you enjoy it. We really enjoyed writing it. Uh, it was challenging, I'll admit, because it was written in real time as data was coming in and there were a lot of things to update. Uh, and I'm grateful to Aging, the journal, for making papers available and published within rapid time. And I can tell you that the review process, the peer review process was extensive. We've got pages and pages of comments from, from reviewers that, that really helped, in, particularly in this case. So enjoy the paper, and I'll keep you updated through my other social media, but also through papers that we hope to publish in the next few months. Thanks. Take care.